Well, for me, it's a lack of patience, pure and simple. I mean, look, this thing's got all its knobs and all the binding posts are in good shape. That leather strap is about as good as any I've ever seen. So when that vintage oscilloscope shows up at the door, you throw all caution to the wind and power it up, right? Well, that's the wrong thing to do, but okay. I get it. You start turning knobs or pressing buttons, trying to get a reaction out of it. But no matter what you try to do, nothing seems to happen. You try a few standard tests like tapping your fingers on the horizontal and vertical inputs but there is no deflection in either direction. It just sits there. All you get is a cold stare like Hal on one of his bad days, and like Hal, you realize you'd better power it down now and have a look at it inside before something bad happens, just like you should have done in the first place. With that keen eye and attention to detail, it doesn't take long to notice that gaping hole in the chassis and some black goo oozing away from it running over the connector for the tube rectifier like a breach from the La Brea tar pit. Clearly a catastrophic failure of some sort involving the filter capacitors. So you look around and take note of other potential issues, like the three high-powered paper capacitors leaking wax all over the inside of the cover. Other electrolytic and paper caps have fared the years a little bit better, but as a standard practice of preventative maintenance, large aging caps such as these are typically replaced en masse. The prevailing thinking is that they may not be bad now, but they're well into their last good years and weren't designed to last forever. So go they must. They're on my early list of things to do. And I guess that includes that cool-looking red one that says Planet on it. Even it must go, so I compile a list, find a vendor, and place an order. One of the nice surprises tucked inside the cover was an original copy of the manual. Tattered and well used, all the pages were there, including those that are not available in any of the online copies that I've seen. Obviously, the manual is a bit sparse compared to Tektronix documentation standards, but it's clear and concise and contains all the steps necessary to assemble the kit from scratch. Inside the manual was a hand-drawn diagram depicting what can only be the capacitor can wiring. It's hard to tell if they were preserving the original wiring for a later restoration or if they were diagramming how it should have been wired after some sort of a mistake. I'm no police detective or forensic expert, but I've seen enough cop shows to recognize the splatter on this resistor, which is usually indicative of a fluid being expelled at great velocity, like when a capacitor bursts open, for instance. I decided to take advantage of this lag time by reviewing the installation manual step by step from beginning to end in order to ensure that there were no shorts, grounds, or errors in the wiring or assembly that may have led to the failure. These images are pictorial diagrams from the installation instructions. I do not recall seeing this section in the online documentation. It seemed like the section was missing in those that I saw at any rate. ICO 460 owners who do not have the manuals may be interested in reviewing or screen capturing this content. Some of the drawings, like this one, show the surface mount before it was populated, with another shot of it later after the components had been installed. A few of the drawings depict obscure mounting locations on the frame or elsewhere. I found these drawings to be of immense value when used in conjunction with the schematic. And as for my audit of the installation, well, it turns out that the guy did a great job. A better job than I would have done, probably. Another thing I decided to do while waiting for the delivery of the caps, and while under a strict prohibition against powering up the scope, was to take measurements where I could, primarily resistance and capacitance readings. I actually measured them in circuit, and although one can rightly argue the validity of this approach, 
It was a quick one or two hour task that in some cases did point to areas warranting a closer look. Eventually my delivery would show up in the mail. By that time I would be most anxious to plug the spanky new can into the vacant slot just to be sure it would fit properly according to Mallory's specifications for twist capacitor cans. As it turned out, it fit perfectly. This is essentially a result of buying what was available. I wanted a can to fill a hole in the chassis and it had to be a four-sided twist can housing at least three 20 by 450 caps. I was happy to find something so close to those specs. My only concern being the possible confusion factor given that there was an additional 10 microfarad cap in the new can. A misinterpretation of one of the pictorial drawings we viewed earlier was a very real possibility. This image depicts a capacitor C27D as being located inside the can with a termination in the same place where the new 10 microfarad capacitor is located. It also shows that termination being used to interconnect R53 to terminal block 93. But there is no C27D anywhere in the schematic. There is no C27D anywhere in the parts list. So we're stuck wondering if they're just leveraging a dummy terminal as some sort of interconnect. I didn't realize it at the time, but my misinterpretation of all of this information would lead me down one of the longest wild goose chases in the history of tube electronics. I'll show some of that now in hopes that it won't happen to someone else. We'll lay the groundwork for this with a quick review of the 460 schematic. I've inverted the color so that my highlights will stand out a little better. The primary sections of the schematic include the power transformer, rectifier, and filters, the CRT and associated signal conditioning, the horizontal trace and sync control, and the vertical input balance and deflection circuitry. My planned recap of the scope would happen in two phases based on receipt of shipment. I ordered some of the caps from Antique Electronics Supply and some from DigiKey. The first phase arrived from Antique Electronics and are circled here. We begin after those parts were replaced. Okay, so this is the same trace that I've been fighting with for quite a while now. I can turn this up a little bit and you could kind of see how that is formed. You can kind of see the lines racing around it like it was some kind of three-dimensional race track or a figure eight race track or something. But that should be a, a straight line, it's not. And I've hooked, I've hooked it up to the Heath kit and if I barely turn on the power on the Heath kit, you can kind of see the wavelengths kind of dance a little bit along that path. But the problem is that that trace is looped back into a, a sort of a warped figure eight. Again, turn the power back down. You can kind of see how the traces are going, are forming. And then just turning on the heat kit a little bit. Kind of shows the wavelengths following that track. If I turn it up, it just becomes an unrecognizable mess. Let me see if I can turn the vertical down a little bit, change to a flatter wave. And center it a little bit better than it is. Add a little more power. And then 
increase the domain of time. It's trying to it's trying to draw the waves. It just it just can't do it. So it's fairly apparent that by the time the second batch of capacitors finally arrived from DigiKey, I was in a fairly deep state of confusion. The things circulating in my head at the time were A, there must have been an explosion of the old filter caps, and B, I wasn't sure what else may have been impacted by that event. At the time, it seemed entirely possible that the incident with the filter capacitors could have been a symptom of a larger problem, such as a bad but functioning transformer, or perhaps other components throughout the scope had succumbed in sympathy. These concerns sent me looking for other visible hints of problem. I did find, for instance, a resistor hanging by one lead, with one of a different spec installed in its place, and still another out-of-spec resistor nearby. This made me think that someone may have been trying to compensate for bad readings by changing the value of a few components. I added those two resistors to the second phase of the recap to bring them back into spec. Okay, it looks about looks similar, although it's a lot dimmer. So it looks like the intensity control works a little bit differently now that those um, capacitors in the CRT section have been chained out. I mean, before it seemed like I didn't get much of a response out of it, but now there's definitely different levels of intensity here. I had it before, but, but not quite this much. The focus is out a little bit too. Ooh. Coming in pretty sharp now. But we still have that crazy pattern. Uh, it didn't really fix anything, any of that. But that's a, that's a pretty sharp trace. Uh, see what happens if I play around with some of these other settings. That looks a little bit different. Yeah, the phasing works now. Let's look for external. Obviously, that's not too good, but let's see what else we got. Okay, we've got a signal of sorts anyway. I mean, looks like it's got a lot of noise in it or echo or something. Like something is reverberating back. I mean, the sine wave doesn't look too sine-like, that's for sure. But it's starting to look a little bit better. Uh, you know, you hope for a miracle, but You'll take steady progress if you can get it. Let me try putting in an external source from the from the Heath kit over here. Oh, let me put it in this jack here. Uh oh, that's too too much power. It's closer, but no cigar. It, uh, it's got a lot of reflections or whatever that is. So I'm going to have to, I think the, the, the place to go now is to start going in and looking at, uh, at the power levels now and comparing them to what they were before 
see where we've improved it, see where we haven't. So I'll go in and take some power readings and see where we stand. Unfortunately, a review of the current power stats showed that the only area of improvement occurred at V10, the CRT, and only after the high voltage capacitors in its section were changed out. Graphically, the pins in orange are out of tolerance as recommended by the 460 installation manual. Those in yellow are good, but borderline. At this point, I began suspecting the transformer and focused my attention on the run between the filter capacitors of the lower right and the vertical amplification section on the upper left. I'm not getting very far with the power thing, so I decided to fire up the Tektronix and dig it out of the closet. What I want to do is trace the ripple, the power ripple through this, uh, through this oscilloscope and see if I see anything that looks, or if, if anything draws my attention. So we need to start down here. This is the, uh, the rectifier tube. It's a V9 and I'm on pin six. So I'm going to turn this on and we'll see what the ripple shows up. You can see that's the ripple coming right off of the uh, off of the rectifier, and this is what the uh, those filter capacitors that blew up. This is what it, it has to smooth out. Now this is really it only shows a range of about 15 volts there, but that's 15 volts sitting right on the top of a 400 uh, volt DC uh, signal. So. Um, I, I put this uh, capacitor before my probe to try to protect it so it wouldn't burn up. And uh, uh, hopefully it'll work. It seems to be working okay. Okay, so now I've, I've moved it to the output of that uh, first resistor, which is also the input to the first capacitor. In this case, it's, I think, 27B on that on those three capacitors that are in that can that I replaced. If the early photos that I took, that's where the explosion in this thing took place. So uh, let's turn the power back on. See what the ripple looks like coming out of here. On this side of the resistor, you can see that it's kind of bouncing up and down and it's it's gone way down. The voltage level if that other one is what almost 15 volts not quite 15 volts that is what five volts per division so you're really only looking at maybe a two volt or ripple at the top of that signal okay so we're at the input of uh r29 which is a 2.5 kilo ohm resistor <clears throat> also five watts so yeah yeah that's about the same okay so we're looking at uh, pen three v2 and we'll turn this one on and see what we get yeah it, it's a lot better than it was so okay so this is going into the uh to r19 which is the second 2.5 kilo ohm resistor um let me turn that on yeah Again, it's a lot. It's a lot smaller. It's not completely gone, but it is a lot smaller than it was. Okay, so this is the other side of that uh, 2.5 kilo ohm resistor at R19. So we'll turn the power on here, and it should be smoothing it even even more, but not smoother. Not smoother at all. In fact, that looks like it's every bit as bad as it was when it came off of the off the rectifier before any smoothing ever took place. So let me, uh, you know, I'm going to take a look at something here. I want to see what the frequency is on this thing. We'll just say, we'll look at one cycle here. And look at that, yeah. I'm not sure why it looks like, why it wouldn't be 60, but who knows. 
So I think what we probably should do is trace it through. The next place it goes is to R13, which is another resistor back in this mess. So that second one, that second one with its uh, orange, white, red, that's the, uh, that's R13. So I'll shut the power off of this and we'll take a reading there. Okay, so this is the output of R13. It's uh, also the input of V2 pin 8. So let me turn the power on. Yeah, the noise is there. I mean, if you think about it, that's the input. That input on pin 8, that's actually the screen grid of that, uh, of that tube. V2 and also that particular location is tied daisy chained right over to V1 on its pin 8 so whatever we see on this chain on the bottom is going to be on the other half of that tube man that is a tough pin to get to okay so uh, right now I'm on the plate the plate of the first circuit within that tube this tube actually has uh, two circuits in it, and both of them are used here. So uh, we'll take a look. In fact, it's amplified coming out of the tube. It's even worse than it was. I'm not sure what the voltage level is there, but it's worse than it was coming out of the original rectifier. I can tell you that. As a brief review of where we went with this ripple testing, we started out at the rectifier at the lower right. We saw the ripple decrease as we moved across two of the filter capacitors and R77. Then we took measurements at R29, V2 pin 3, and R19, seeing an increasingly smoother ripple as we progressed. That changed on the other side of R19 where we saw a waveform that looked much like the raw rectifier output before any filtering had taken place. We found that the signal was present at pins 8 and 9 on B2A and on up to R21. Ultimately, I traced the signal all the way to the plate on the CRT before abandoning the approach. In hindsight, I wish I had taken measurements on the other leads coming out at P2A. It seems like such an obvious move, but for some reason I dropped it for then and moved on. Anyway, so this is the uh, this is the kind of trace that I get now, no matter what. Um, in particular, I'm talking about regardless of what the source is. Um, when looking at this horizontal selector here. It's kind of a pigtail. And basically, no matter what I set on any of these four sweeps, I get the same thing. So here I'm at the minus, and I'll switch this to the plus. And you don't see any change at all. It's exactly the same thing. Sometimes I can get it to hold still. Um, and then I switch, uh, switch it over to horizontal, you know, the external sink, and it's the same thing. Nothing. And then when I uh, move it over to 60 cycles, it's the same thing here, too. It's not changing. It's just, you know, whatever we're looking at is wherever it's getting it from. Uh, it's It might be the 60 cycles, and that's what it it winds up looking like, but you can't select anything any different. It's always the same. So I'm going to take a look, go underneath with the oscilloscope or the Tektronix oscilloscope and just see where I'm losing this signal. Okay, this is uh, coming right off of pin 7 on that switch into, I think it's C29. And this is what we see when we have it set to, I think it's minus on there. And as I flip through, that's plus. This is external, which you would expect because we don't have anything hooked up to it. And this is 
60 cycles internal. So the switch isn't isn't bad, but that's the 60 cycles coming off, off of the power. This is the external feed, and I have no reason to think that any of this is wrong right now. This one is... Uh, let me make sure I got that right. I think that's the plus. Yeah, that one's the plus. And this one is the minus. So this is coming off of the vertical side. Uh, and we'll just move quickly down the, down the line. Uh, this is pin 7 of uh, V5, which is the second triode of that tube. And it looks the same, no different, no different results. All right, so I'll do this one fast. This one is uh, the pin. This is the plate leaving that um, second half of this uh, this tube, second triode, and. Eh, I just lost. I got to turn it back on, and it's looking crazy at this point. It's really, really high voltage. Really noisy coming out of there. Um, it's definitely not the same. Let me try to change the channels. But we do still get some sort of change. That I have never seen before. And this is, this has got only a sync pulse, I think. Let me see what this is. Yeah. That's the, uh, that's from the sweeper in here. It's a regular pulse to uh, try to bring the signal into sync. Which is, there is no signal on this channel. And this is supposedly that 60 cycles again so it's really amplified coming out of here uh, i don't think it looks like the same signal so this is uh actually a 12 au7 i'm going to shut this off for now i don't like the looks of that this is uh yeah 12 au7 now we're only looking at the second second trial let me look at the doc at the uh, schematic and see what it says about the other side okay so this is pin two going into the uh, first triode of that v5 and this is what it's producing this is probably clean it you know it's the uh sync pulse from the uh from the sweeper near and I think that, that's what was actually making that popping sound when I was listening to it through the uh, signal tracer. So we'll see what it looks like leaving the tube. Okay, I couldn't get to that pen very easily, so what I did is I just moved to where the other end of that lead where it's at. But this is uh, pen one, which is the anode of that uh, that part of the tube and it it looks like it's smoothed out by the time it gets here uh, probably by the tube because I don't really see a, I don't see anything in between there so uh, I don't really see anything wrong there okay so this is the cathode of that first triode and it looks just like uh, just like what's coming in on the grid so uh, I don't know if they're tied together. Yeah, that's the problem with this particular oscilloscope is that it just blanks out. Um, 2467s are, did that all the time when you're working on something from what I've, from the research that I've done since I bought this one. This one, by the way, is, this was broken in shipping. And uh, I mean, it actually broke every single one of these uh, potentiometers and I had to super glue them back together because it's an impossible part to get they're more common in the 2465s but the 67 has a big long shaft on it and you just can't find them without paying 
as much for that part as I paid for the entire oscilloscope. So I glued them back together and this one I wasn't able to get working. It was actually sitting over here uh, under the uh, intensity I think it is. No, that's the focus. It was actually the focus and I need to focus a lot more than I do need the backlighting, you know, on this thing. So I swapped them and uh, I've actually removed this because it just gets in the way. But at some point I'm going to go in and redo all that, but I'm getting off track right now. Uh, for some reason, I'm well, it, it may be right, I don't know, but I'm seeing exactly the same thing on the cathode that I'm seeing coming in off the grid. So, just make a note of that. Okay, I, uh, I forgot to, to shoot the cathode of, of the uh, second triode in this thing, so um, it's on pen 8. I'm pretty sure that's correct. Uh, when I look over here, I really don't see anything at all, so I'll have to try to understand what that means. Um, but there definitely is a huge difference in what's leaving this tube. Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna pull out the tube sheet and see. Not that I not that I'm gonna be able to do anything about it, but. Uh, I did get a tube tester, although I haven't had a chance to completely uh, restore it. I, I, I did change out uh, one of the one of the older capacitors inside of it, but um, it's far from being restored. But I may just go ahead and test the tube to see see if it's got any kind of failures on it. I mean, we get down to the next one, and that's the one where I was really seeing all of the noise, not this one. This is a V6 down here. You can kind of see the, the glow inside there, which is interesting. I don't... The glow's a lot less on that tube than it is when I look through the bottom hole on this one. Let me see what these look like. Yeah, you can really see those two. Of course, it's dark back in there, but um, do I have any other tubes that I can I can do that kind of thing with? This one never did never does glow very much. It's that one V two, but that's kind of cool. You can see through those holes. Yeah, yeah, there it is. This one, you can see it, but it's not. Not as bright. I'm going to run this one through a tube tester. Okay, so this is the uh, booklet that comes with my Mighty Might. And this thing's been beat up, banged up, mistreated, or just well used over the years. Maybe the guy got his money worth out of this thing, but uh, it's been around the block and beat up quite a bit. And what I'm looking at is this uh, 12AU7, very small booklet. Uh, and for the first one, I got to test 12D8B and then put it in slot 4. So 12D8B4. You definitely do not want to do this wrong because you'll smoke a tube if you do. I know that because I did it. Uh, I decided after I changed the capacitor to test one and I set this thing up wrong. And... <laughs> You know, for me, tubes are hard to come by. But anyway, uh, here's the tube. And then I put it in this fourth slot. So you can see I have it set. That's 12D. And then over there, it's set to E. And then B. So um, that's how the testing, I mean, that's how you set it up to begin with, and you do that before you apply power. And if I can get this thing to plug in, it's a very loose slot. Um, I hope it's making contact. So, anyway, let's, uh, first thing you're supposed to, uh, on most of these, you're supposed to do a shorts test. They say that you don't have to do that with a Mighty Mite. 
but you got to wait for the tube to warm up and you can see this one is glowing with the short test you just flip through all of these switches switch settings I'll switch hands here and then you look at that short indicator quick flash like that is okay as long as it doesn't come on and stay on and there are no shorts so I set it back to B which is uh, I think that that's one of the grids and then I'm supposed to do well there's a grid leakage test and it it didn't move at all but that grid leakage is the bottom bar the one that says good on it and then this is an emission test and it's supposed to go over to the other side because it's that top bar and I don't know do I got a problem with this uh, with this thing I got to test the other side so I'll shut it back off and throw the switch over so I can test the other side okay so the only thing I had to do was change the filament over to E it's the only difference on this side so uh, tubes cooled down I'm gonna throw it to short test again I don't I don't think I have to run the short test again because it was actually run the first time and but I do have to wait for this thing to warm up a little bit um, we'll see what it does on the emission okay so that side is good the emission test passes and then grid leakage is good too so kind of looks like one half of this thing is bad so okay i've uh i've made some progress after finding that bad tube and correcting a mistake i made earlier on so there was a procedural error um I'll talk about that a little bit later, but what, what you're looking at is a waveform <laughs> correcting mistake I made earlier on, so there was a procedural error. 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 Notice how I tried to gently tiptoe around this rather significant development. But that wasn't some ordinary error like twisting the wrong pot or forgetting to place the tubes back in their sockets. This was the kind of error that sends one off on a tangent direction for over a month. To review, this is where we stood after the electrolytic and paper capacitors had been replaced, along with a couple of resistors. After an early round of voltage readings and ripple testing, it was determined that R13 had drifted out of spec and needed to be replaced. That voltage testing identified four separate pockets of concern, beginning with the vertical circuitry outlined in red here. A second area turned up in the sweep selector, with still another feeding the horizontal plates in the CRT, and finally another one in the horizontal amplifier. So the approach was to look for out of spec resistors, beginning with these two just inside the vertical input. Note that these two resistors were simply the wrong spec. They had not necessarily drifted out. They were 22K instead of the required 220K. And another shown here, however, was uh, output from the sweep vernier pot to the sweep selector, which had drifted out. Replacing those resistors may have brought them back into spec, but it wound up having absolutely no impact on the power problems or the issues with the display. Taking a closer look at the pockets identified earlier, it was clear that the one in the horizontal amplifier section was closely associated with the one in the horizontal plates in the CRT. They were one and the same. 
and with a little imagination one might even be able to find a way to pull the sweep selector into that mix. But what about the vertical amplifier section? Well, it turns out there was a connection between the two circuits that appears to feed into that narrative, but all of those resistors had already been tested and the bad ones had been replaced. But this lead branching off to the right takes us to a bypass resistor that had been tested pretty thoroughly and a capacitor that had already been replaced. Following it further still takes us back to the filter capacitors, all of which had been replaced, by the way, and finally to a center tap on the power transformer. Except that this isn't what we have. This is. Looking back at the drawing, it seems the engineers intended to run the center tap through the negative legs of the filter capacitors before reaching the horizontal and vertical amplifier sections rather than going to chassis ground. Any fluctuations in this center tap may not have shown up in my DC voltage test because it was unfiltered AC going straight to the cathodes in the amplifier sections. It might have shown up in the ripple testing, though, but recall I inexplicably dropped the approach after tracing the ripple all the way to the CRT and never returned to V2A. So how did I manage to go from this to this? Well, to answer that question, we have to rewind to the time when I compiled the list and place an order for the recap. At that time, I wasn't just looking for a list of capacitors. I was also looking for a dummy can to fill the gaping hole in the chassis, since there wasn't one there when I received the scope. I had asked the seller if they had it, but found that it was apparently discarded. So my search involved looking through eBay to see if I could find one. While shopping, I noticed that CE had caps in a can that fulfilled the need. They seemed a bit expensive, but I saw it as taking out two birds at once with an extra capacitor in there to boot. Instead of a dummy can with three electrolytics, I would install a fully functional can with four, where the extra cap uh, wound up being leveraged as a replacement for C15. This mistake was reinforced when I misinterpreted the purpose of C27D in the pictorial diagram. I had seen cans before that used the extra termination as an unused connection and assumed that this was no different. But it appeared it wasn't an unused connection. It was instead a tie point for the negative legs of all three caps housed in the can. This subtle difference did not have subtle ramifications. They were in your face. I contacted CE and asked them if they made cans with the negative legs exposed on a termination isolated from the case. The person I corresponded with indicated that all of their cans terminated the negative leads onto the casing. Since there would be no replacement can, I would have to return to my original plan, which was to install a dummy Mallory into the slot and replace the electrolytics with individual components wired according to the schematic. Once I did that, everything was working much better. So what lesson do we glean from this? Use drawings for their intended purpose. Pictorial diagrams are fine. They're great as a supplement to the schematic if you want to buzz out a circuit quickly. But you shouldn't base any decisions about functionality on them because it might lead you to overlook something important. Moving on, I continued testing resistors, replacing those that I found in drifting out of spec. Where we stand now, our current replacement status is outlined in green. Okay, this is the stuff that I pulled out of the uh, oscilloscope, the ICO 460, so far. Um, basically, I've gone through and I've looked at them with an ohm meter and just checked the capacitance on them. All of these are bad, and all of those are bad. 
and of course the three capacitors that that were gone missing when I bought the scope those are those you can count those as bad these tested good oddly enough and so did these now these I think were uh, I pulled them out simply because of the wrong size uh, compared to the schematic and the two discs capacitors that you see there they were pulled out because they were part of an RC uh, pair where the resistors were the wrong size and when I replaced them I just put new capacitors in uh, they're still good they measure out good um, these there's no way they're I, I mean I don't see how they can be good the, 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 the five that you're looking at there the paper ones especially the three that are leaking wax all over the place. Um, but, you know, their capacitance measured good. I think I might just test them with a, I have one of those capacitor t uh, leakage testers and I'll bet you that, that those come up bad. But um, out of all of the stuff that I've taken out so far, really most of it's bad. The only stuff that that's still good are like I say, those two disc capacitors and and the two resistors, and that's because they were part of part of some combination of, you know, the wrong, wrong spec for what was called for in the drawing, the schematic, or in the addenda that came out later and revised it. Okay, so this is uh, one of them that tested out, uh, tested. Well, I mean, the capacitance was right on it are pretty close. I think it was 0.11, something like that. So I'll just, I think with these, these are not electrolytic, so I can just run them straight up to 600 and see what happens with them. I'm not going to try to dial it in. I think I'll just head straight for the, for the leakage test. And ordinarily what happens is you see that aisle start to open up. If it's a good capacitor, that eye pops open real fast once you have it, it dialed in. Ordinarily, you set it to that. You see that the eye is set, and then you go ahead and, and crank this thing over. In this case, I'm just going to do the resistance test, and then we'll see what happens on that meter up there. Uh, it, you know, like I say, this one tested okay. Uh, yeah, it's got a little leakage. It didn't come right back, and yeah, that would cause a performance issue of some sort, I think. So that one's that one has some leakage associated with it, even though it measures out right. Um, I'll hook up a different one. This one. Uh, what size is this one? 0.25. And again, it tested out just fine. So. Oh, I shut the power off on it. Okay. See how long it takes for, for that eye to open this time. It opened pretty quick. It's opened already, so... Let's go ahead and throw it. Whoops, not this one, this switch. Well, it's not, it's not popping right back down either. So yeah, this one appears to have some leakage issues <clears throat> as well. So I don't have to, I'll disconnect this one, move on to the next one. These wax ones, I I don't even know that I need to test those. They're are they're all they all have wax, but these are actually leaking the wax. It's, it's not an it's not leaking electronically. It's leaking the wax. But these are the thousand. These were the high voltage ones, thousand volts. So let's turn this on. Oh. 
it probably makes a difference. I probably don't have the right end, but in fact, let me switch that around so that I give it a decent shot at it anyway. I don't know what I did with the other ones. I may have had those leads re reversed too, so I'll go back and look at when I review the video. All right, let's turn this back on. What I did is I just moved the black, I made sure that the black one was on the, on the line, which is I think the foil side of that. So it's ready to go. And, eh, yep, it's leaking. Okay, this one's the same size, 0.1 and uh, 1,000 volts. Eyes opened up. Not that one, this one. not too good yeah I don't need to test it any longer than that okay and then there's one more we'll run a test on that This one actually came back not that bad. <clears throat> I think this one is the one that was, yeah, that's the one that's the most tacky. It did, mo it did most of the leaking, and it's actually performed a little bit better than all the other ones. Not much, but a little bit. So really what it comes down to is all of these capacitors are bad. I'm not going to bother testing the the little disc ones, but uh, even though they measured good capacitance-wise, they failed leakage testing. Okay, so. I've uh, I made some progress after finding that bad tube and correcting a mistake I made earlier on. So there was a procedural error. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit later, but what, what you're looking at is a waveform at three and a half megahertz, which this thing tops out at four, but three and a half is as high as the uh, Hickok will go. And, and I'm not, I've not really uh, sold that the uh, Heath kit is working as good as it should. So I still have a couple of issues though. And it's not readily apparent on this end. One of the uh, issues I still have with this uh, with this oscilloscope is that when I have it set to this lowest value on the sweep selector, which is 10 to 100, I have this sort of non-linear waves, or you know, they're they're really not linear across the screen. When you look at the left-hand side, they're much wider. They become more compressed as you move towards the right hand side of the display. And if I was to increase the frequency and increase this, yeah, have to have to get it back in sync. But you can see that it begins to balance itself out a little bit. There's still a little bit of deviation, but the deviation is more towards the middle of the display. And if I go to go higher still, 
I think right now we're looking at what, 10,000 cycles. And once you get to 100,000 cycles and up, still the, the, the issue doesn't present itself. Where it really hits is when I'm at, when I'm looking at very low frequencies. And let me get back down. This is, I think this is a hundred cycles here. If I go down to 60, it begins to show itself up a little bit more and more. So, um, something unique about the lowest settings on this. And the one thing that stands out is that there's a capacitor uh, that is unique to that lowest setting. Also, it's it also uh, is involved in the TV. See that same image shows up when you get down into this. Which one is that? TVB. Because they're bridged together and they use the exact same capacitor. So. I'm wondering if there's an issue with that. Okay, the capacitor in question is that large uh, capacitor, the black one with the yellow writing on it. Um, it's 0.1 microfarad. And when I measure it, now I'm measuring it in circuit, I realize that, but um, it's well over the 10% at this point. It should be 100 nanofarads. And, you know, in the high 90s or low 100s, but this one's kind of high. If, if I throw the switch so that it isn't connected any longer, you can see it drops down to about 125. So the circuit does take it down a little bit, but not much. The other side of it's tied to ground. <clears throat> I think that w w with it thrown like this, the switch throws it wide open so um, it's a little bit a little bit out let me let me okay, take so it out right now I've got it on the internal sweep which is the 60 cycles coming off of the power um, what I've done is on that external capacitor um, option on this dial I've tied a uh, 0.1 microfarad capacitor to that switch setting. There's a lead that's supposed to connect out here to this external capacitor um, tie here, right here, but that lead is currently broken and I'll have to go in and fix that. But it's a handy thing where I could have been able to just tie you know, a 0.1 microfarad capacitor there to see if replacing it would have eliminated this problem but okay i've got it tied off over here instead for right now so uh, i'm going to throw this switch here to external capacitor and see if replacing this thing yeah see now that's a much balanced much more balanced trace now um i think that the that, that we probably have a bad capacity we may have one uh, unless it's something else that's tied to that part of the switch but but um Looking at this here, it really improves at least the... Uh, uh, changing out that capacitor cleared up the last known problem that I had with the oscilloscope. Now, there's probably other issues that I could work on and things that I could search down for to try to, try to clear out, but um, for the most part, I've got most of the issues resolved. Uh, this video itself is getting to be pretty close to one hour, so I think I'm going to cut it off here. And I already have a, a, a separate video uh, where I kind of put this thing through its paces to test it out and make sure it's uh, uh, operating in a way that, that I think it should. So I'd like to thank you if you've uh, made it this far through the video.